at the end. Um, okay, Chad, are you ready to go? Yes, ma'am. Thank you, Elaine. Again, my name is Chad Murray. Good afternoon to everyone. I am the Director of Field Services at BuySales, and I thank everyone for taking the time to sit in with us this afternoon. I uh, was just asking Elaine that I'm sure everyone is just about probably webinar out, but I'm glad you're here, and I hope this one is a little different. I uh, have the background. I did own a rural WISP. I did build out uh, over a lot of fiber areas and used uh, LTE to expand into areas that fiber couldn't get to, and it, it was very fruitful and beneficial to myself. So as we get started, just a little bit about buy sales from a, from a high level. Uh, obviously, we are customer focused. We're privately funded and operated. We take security incredibly serious, especially in these times. Uh, our cloud core services are housed on Microsoft's Azure servers, and they are located all here in the States. Uh, it's a privately held business with large investors, such as Qualcomm. Uh, we focus on your needs first. To meet the growing demand for the increased connectivity and supply, our production is booming, and we've moved our manufacturing plants to Taiwan, Hong Kong, and Vietnam. So that's that right there. I mean, we are now, you know, we're manufactured in uh, Taiwan, Hong Kong, and Vietnam. Uh, with that come, you know, we have trusted partnerships. We've developed several partnerships over the years, and we continue to collaborate to create the LTE and five, the 5G platforms. Um, you can see below, those are some of our partnerships. We have some very influential partners in our technology growth. And they, they share the same vision and development as us. Uh, this is what allowed this is what has allowed us to invest and drive innovations in upcoming technology such as 5G and open RAN. <clears throat> I found this slide yesterday when I was looking and I thought it really played well to what rural America is missing. I'm from rural America. I live in southeast New Mexico, West Texas, where it's extremely just open plains. And, and fiber couldn't get to me affordably and efficiently in the next probably five to 10 years. So I rely heavily on an LTE network right now where I am, and it is a ISO's network. Yeah. So currently 80% of the 24 million of American households do not have reliable, affordable, high-speed internet in rural areas. And that comes from the FCC. So when you get this slideshow, that's a clickable link that you can go read. That's not something i'm you know just making up so fiber optic connections although they make up the majority of the internet's backbone and infrastructure they are future proofed but those connections are still only available to 25 percent of the u.s population that's where fixed wireless comes in we've enjoyed explosive growth over the past 10 years with hundreds of new uh, local providers coming up and Again, this is a, a clickable link that the average, fi wire, average fixed wireless network speeds increased more than 250% over the past five years. So everyone, you know, I, I, I had a rule wisp, like I said, if I could get into it again today, I would, because I think that the wireless broadband is primed to just blow up with this CBRS. And I think if you are a fiber operator, it can complement your network to get you to places that you can build and then grow to, or if you're competing against a fiber operator, you can find those rural pockets that we'll look at in a second and target those to provide service. And, and I think everyone on here knows, as a smaller provider, once you get that loyalty and you can think outside the box, you'll keep that customer even when fiber does come into their market. So, and I think that's one of the, benefits of being uh, WISP and being able to change on a whim and attack areas. So here were some market opportunities. Uh, in a recent survey, 84% of carriers said they're considering or currently offering fixed wireless access. So that's actually fiber people or you know hardwired folks that are still considering deploying wireless solutions. And, and we see them as well all over. A lot of the co-ops, they'll have fiber, but then they'll deploy wireless uh, to the hard, harder to serve customers. 
and it's, it's a good market uh, for them. So in a 2017 report, the Caramel Group forecast that pitch wireless revenue will more than double in five years. And with the advent of 5G, research forecasts that rule favored LTE fixed wireless broadband will grow 26% through 2022 with a market of of $45 billion. And I, I think that number is small with IoT, precision agriculture, and automation all on the way. Internet service providers using wireless technology to offer the most cost-effective solution in vast areas of the US and the world. And there's a chart there that uh, after this, we can dig into and look at, or uh, you can click on the link there and check it out. So. What are we calling the sweet spot? So this area here is the rural market that I'm sure the majority of this group is familiar with. These are the guys that may be getting served with DSL, uh, it, five meg, some are still WiMAX up until October, but this is the group that we're talking about for this area. To get fiber to this group, you know, even if you're doing it yourself, it's gonna, you know, it's tens of thousands of dollars per mile, before you buy your ponds, before you buy your ONTs. And I've always felt like if, if you run fiber, you have to get everything along the way. If, if you're a hunter, it's a deer rifle. You get one shot, one kill, that's it. So every home that you pass without getting them on your fiber is a stranded investment. Now, if you go to a tower and you deploy a wireless network, an LTE network, now you're more like a shotgun blast and you can service everyone in the area and you're not hogtied to the one stop. So that's why wireless is beneficial in these rural areas. You can cover a lot more people, it's more cost effective, and you can organically grow without losing anything as you go through. Here was a, a, a chart we had made to compare the different offerings and how we felt what the rate of return was. So we had some bullet points. We come up with wireless is more cost effective than fiber, just, just like we talked about. You, you can deploy a tower for the same price, you can deploy probably a mile of fiber. And that's with LTE electronics, and with the fiber, that's just physically putting the fiber in the ground without the ponds and the access needed. So we have lower latency than satellite. Something else that comes along if you are deploying satellite, you're not, you are in charge of nothing more than the install. And after that, you have to hand it off and you are relying on uh, Viasat, Intelsat, whoever it is, HughesNet, whoever's on the backside. And if they have an outage or they have a satellite, or a bird hiccup, that affects you. So a lot of other folks, it was the scalability versus mobility. So we, you can battle Verizon, you can battle Timo, you can get the SIM cards, you can do whatever it is you want to do. But now you're going to battle the data caps and the limiting of speeds and how many people are on that tower. And once again, there is no control at the operator level. So from a CapEx OpEx, the, the fiber speeds today, no, no one can argue fiber depending on the core and the electronics. You can get it up to uh, a gig up, a gig down, maybe even up to 10 gig. I'll tell you that I did never mind going up against somebody with fiber because I could explain the difference in why that one gig is a selling point and, and the majority of the customers that had never used much more than 25 meg during peak times right after dinner. So we can agree the fiber is the, the fastest out there today. The upgrade cost, even though it says modest upgrade cost to ponds and software releases, uh, the fiber does remain the same, but there are expenses on the electronics. Uh, the ARPU here, we, we kind of guessed $69 is, is probably good ARPU that we're not taking into account any contracts, the $29.99 versus, you know, $199 at the end of a contract and I'll come back as the payback period is five years. So if, if someone is laying fiber in the ground today, it'll take them five years before that piece is paid for and that customer is providing revenue. 
the cable side of it, uh, 150 meg, it is extremely high to upgrade cable. That's why a lot of your cable companies are going to fiber also. And the ARPU on a cable company, again, we decide $42, three years to fix it. Satellite is very iffy. Again, not much is in the control of the operator. Uh, and the payback period, depending on the contract that you have with the satellite guy, uh, it, it, it may not ever pay back. So mobile, but let's, we'll get on to fixed wireless. So this is where uh, fixed wireless, we have the speed right now at 100 megabits. And I think that's very, uh, I don't think that's generous enough because with carrier aggregation in our 436Q units, we can now offer you know a two carrier up to 200 megabits worth of speed. Upgrade cost, we call it modest as well. There are incremental upgrades that you can do for whether it be from a single carrier to a dual carrier to carrier aggregation. And as we grow from a CAT 6 to a CAT 12 to a CAT 15 CPE, there will be modest upgrades. One of the beauties of LTE being standard based is it is backwards compatible that you'll see in a slide shortly. So even though we say this is modest and uh, upgrade costs, if you have a customer that is very happy with in one direction, they may not need the upgrade to the CAT 12 or the CAT 15. And you can, again, organically grow into those. The broadband ARPU, having a company, I had an ARPU between $75 and $85. And my payback period was between four and six months. And with the right design, the right layout, I 100% agree that in four to six months, the customer that you installed four to six months down the road now has, is in the black and providing profit moving forward as long as you can keep them. So I'm gonna hand it off to Mr. Mao. He is our CBS expert. Uh, Ronald, if you yes. are ready to talk about CBRS, I will let you take off. All right, thank you, uh, Chad, for the introduction and Elaine for putting to putting this together. This is Ronald. I'm a director of Carrier Solutions, and I've been working on getting our products ready for CBRS applications. And uh, I would be happy to introduce the CBRS technologies and our product readiness. So CBRS uh, is, uh, ref is referring to a uh, the 3.5 gigahertz frequency bands that is meant to be uh, low cost. Uh, it gives the operators the opportunity to apply their own fixed wireless network with their own frequency bands at low cost. It lowers the barriers for the operators to do so. So and here are the slides I am um, comparing the 3.5 uh, CBRS bands with uh, other uh, available uh, frequency bands that are popular in fixed wireless uh, access and give you a perspective uh, if you are in the business of choosing a, a frequency band for your fixed wireless application. Um, 2.5 gig is popular, it's the education band. It has been around uh, for many years. The advantage is that uh, this is um, uh, a popular LTE um, frequency band that uh, uh, many uh, Wix, Wix operators are taking advantage of. But however, the uh, shortcoming of this uh, band is that it is uh, licensed. And uh, up to today, most of these uh, these assets were owned by a Sprint uh, for a long period of time. So for uh, a uh, fixed wireless app operator, which are new to this business, it is uh, pretty hard to get uh, because the uh, auctions of this uh, frequency bands as are, has been uh, over for a long time. Um, another popular band in the fixed wireless access is the uh, totally license-free five gigahertz band, which is popular in a, in a Wi-Fi. Uh, it is totally unlicensed. That's the good news. 
but the bad news is that uh, the interference risk is high because it is unlicensed. Anybody can use it and grab it and use it. And the interference becomes out of control. And uh, the uh, line of sight propagation uh, is also poor because the fact that it is running on a high frequency. And looking forward, uh, there is a millimeter wave, like 24 gigahertz band that people are also considering to apply uh, in a 5G uh, applications. The advantage is that it is uh, licensed uh, so that uh, interference can be controlled very well. But uh, however, the line of sight uh, property is also poor because, due to the fact that the frequency is very high. And five, uh, the CBRS is uh, a band that uh, uh, compared to all those other bands has, has the advantage of being uh, lightly licensed, meaning that it has the best of the both world. It, it is a, it is, uh, a good, uh, compared to, it has the unlicensed, the advantage of an unlicensed band in the fact, in, due to the fact that it is, the cost is very low to acquire them. I, I will talk about it in a moment. Uh, but it also has the uh, advantage of the licensed band world, meaning that it is, uh, uh, it is a managed bandwidth. So it's, uh, it is shared, but it's in a, in a, in a in a way that it is managed, so the interference is uh, controlled at the very minimum. And the size of this uh, frequency band is not is also good. It is 150 uh, megahertz that are available. This is a, a huge number because any today, all, even a major mobile mobile operators like Verizon or AT&T, the total frequency assets that they have is averaged at 130. So that is, this 150 is a pretty large frequency pool that uh, many uh, ISP or WISP operators can take advantage of. Okay. And uh, I, I would like to talk more about this lightly licensed uh, concept of the CBRS band. If you look at the diagrams on the right, the CBRS band are tiered into three uh, layers. At the top is the uh, is the, uh, uh, the the layer that is uh, in incumbent, meaning that nobody can touch it. Uh, this is a band that is uh, released by the FCC from for the for commercial use because originally it was used by military and government. And those uses has to be protected. For, but fortunately, most of these users are along the coastlines. So for the rural operators, which are far away from the coastlines, uh, the uh, big, the majority of this chunk will be available, made available for commercial use. And the second tier is the uh, Priority ac uh, Access License, or PAL for short. And these uh, are uh, 70, uh, for 70 megs out of the 150 that are available for auction. Uh, anybody who would like to have a priority access to this band can bid for this tier. Uh, matter of fact, the bidding is going on right now and uh, the winners will be announced by in about a week, July 20, 23rd. And the third tier is the General Authorized Access, GAA for short. These are uh, totally shared. Nobody have to bid for it, uh, but you do have to register with one of the uh, Spectrum Access uh, service vendors to get access to this, uh, of this frequency. And uh, the CBRS Alliance has a statistics saying that 41% uh, uh, of the uh, applications for the GAA 
is uh, for wireless, uh, fixed wireless access applications. So it is very popular. CBRS is popular among fixed wireless access uh, operators. All right. So yeah, that's the introduction of the frequency band in general. Let's uh, look at uh, a little bit more on how CBRS works. Uh, next slides, please, chat. And this is how uh, BISOs prepare our product to be CBRS ready. We offer end-to-end -end solutions in the CBRS, solution, uh, CBRS uh, solutions. Uh, the components we um, have um, prepared for these applications include the, on a, the CPE terminals, the e-node bees on the radio access, net, access side, and also we have uh, a core services and either offered as uh, cloud core or local core. On the CPEs and e-node bees or cloud cores are actually um, already available prior to CBRS because they are generic LTE uh, network components. For CBRS, we have introduced a new function, which is the domain proxy. Uh, that is a function that we uh, in introduced for the SAS interface. Uh, for SAS interface, why domain proxy and is important and how it fit into the CBRS solution, we shall see in the next slide. Next slide, please. Thank you. Uh, here it is a diagram that uh, to illustrate the how the CBRS spectrums are managed, managed or allocated, and how uh, uh, radio access uh, network components interface with uh, a SAS. Uh, SAS is uh, a, a server that manages the um, the freq freq uh, frequency spectrum resources or pools for various uh, uh, operators who register with them. The way it works is that uh, it has uh, the SAS itself interfaces with, with FCC database that um, uh, has all the informations of the uh, CBRS devices. CBRS devices, by the way, is referred to as a CBSD. Uh, it uh, can mean either a CPE or a E-Node-B, uh, as, uh, as long as it's transmitting in the uh, RF uh, frequencies. All the devices that, uh, that are put into service has to be certified and registered with the SAS. And the SAS is also uh, in, uh, interfacing or relying on the ES, ESC, which is an environment sensor uh, a, a component, which uh, uh, senses the usage of the uh, incumbent use of um, this spectrum. As we mentioned earlier, uh, some incumbent uh, users, uh, their use has to be protected. And those were uh, detected by the ES ESC and feed and fed into the SAS. So SAS can uh, manage the resources to protect the incumbent use. On a CBSD, be it a CB, uh, CPE or E-Node-B, uh, interface with SAS in one of the two ways. It can interface with SAS directly or it can interface with the SAS through a domain proxy. The, uh, the, the advantage of a domain proxy is that it is, uh, um, it is interfacing the, with the SAS on behalf of the CBSD so that the CBSD do not have to worry about uh, the uh, configurations for the interface with SAS, such as uh, a digital certificate 
the interface to the SAS is through the open network, uh, I, uh, IP network. So that, that access has to be protected, for example, by a digital certificate. By having a domain proxy, the CBSDs are free of uh, installing a digital certificate by itself, and uh, so that uh, the installation of CBSD can be uh, very uh, much more uh, simplified. So we chose to implement our CBR solutions as uh, at uh, by cells with a domain proxy because domain proxy is a function which is uh, co-located with our uh, OMC on the cloud core. Um, here I would like to point out that the SaaS services is fee-based and so is the uh, digital certificate. Uh, so please have those uh, keep those in mind uh, when you are choosing a SaaS uh, service or a uh, uh, SaaS interface strategy. That uh, the the CBRS uh, again the SaaS is uh, the SaaS is the uh, the focal point of your uh, uh, CBRS solutions. Uh, everything else is uh, uh, LTE, uh, which or you are uh, already, uh, if you, you should be already familiar with if you have deployed LTE network. All right, so uh, next week, let's take a look at all the, what the SAS can, uh, SAS can offer uh, besides the spectrum uh, allocation. Previous slides, please, Chad. Here you are, thank you. Uh, the SaaS vendors, SaaS, by sales itself does not offer SaaS uh, uh, service. SaaS service is, uh, uh, has, it's been offered by uh, SaaS uh, vendors. Uh, today, there are five of them that are certified by the FCC, including Amdocs, Comscope, Federated Wireless, Google, and Sony. Uh, BiSelves has uh, made this uh, SaaS services of availabilities to be uh, a vendor uh, independent, meaning that our domain proxies is uh, capable of uh, interfacing with, uh, interworking with any other SaaS vendors. So operators are free to choose any one of them. One, that's one point. I, the other point I would like to uh, uh, make is that uh, typically SaaS vendors offering uh, spectrum access uh, uh, service as well as some additional uh, services comes well, with it, such as a, a network planner. Vendors like Google utilizes their uh, Google map uh, uh, assets to provide uh, uh, network planner uh, planning services for operators if you sign up with Google. And um, almost all, I think, in fact, all of the, those uh, SaaS vendors offering a CPI training, which is the certified professional installer. Why CPI is important? It is mandatory for the operators to install their devices uh, in a professional way uh, because the frequency bands were managed, right? Their locations of the, all these devices has to be registered at the SAS with uh, accurate uh, uh, geolocation information. And those information has to be uh, off, uh, signed up by a, a certified installer. And that certification can be obtained uh, by going through a CPI training, which are offered by all these uh, SaaS vendors. Okay. All right. I think uh, we are ready to take a look at the CBSD or the CBRS devices that BiSales have uh, up to today. Again, BiSales offer end-to-end -end 
uh, CBR solutions. We have uh, um, you know these in uh, different categories, uh, which uh, can be either high power in the outdoor scenario or uh, mid range uh, scenarios, and also uh, we have uh, short range uh, all in one uh, in these. They range. Uh, th these products are uh, typically a Nova 436Q, which uh, has the carrier aggregation capabilities that can double the data throughput in an outdoor application. We have this uh, Nova 233, uh, uh, which is very uh, cost effective to deploy. And uh, we have this Nova 227 that has uh, a built in antenna. And making it a uh, plug uh, and play in ODs in a CBRS deployment. On the CPE side, we have indoor models, uh, the Atom IDUB, and we have outdoor models that uh, has a, a, a low gain antenna built in or uh, a high gain antenna built in. All these devices has been certified uh, by the FCC uh, uh, by the name Part 96. Part 96 refers to CBRS. All these, these devices is also certified by ONGO, uh, which is a uh, interoperability standards created by Wind Forum and the CBRS uh, Alliance. CBRS alliances is promoting LTE technologies for CBRS applications. By having a ONGO logo or certification, it, it, these devices are um, approved as uh, standard uh, LTE devices, which offers a lot of uh, advantages that uh, uh, Chad can uh, talk about. Uh, I think the next slides, right? Okay, um, that's my uh, introduction of the CBRS technology in general. I will hand it back to Chad to uh, continue the, uh, uh, the uh, technologies in general. Thanks, sir. That is that. I, I think that's one of the most important things that that CBRS seemed to really frustrate and care a lot of folks. And I think if there was a reason that I would be ready to jump back into this business and do it again it is because of the cbrs uh the 365 with that 15 megahertz kind of took off like the wild west and it was hard to get people to work with you and now with that and the invention of the cpi i, I think for the folks that already have their cpis you understand the importance of what it does and the responsibility that comes with it because it, it goes with an individual so if you have if you do not have your cpi right now when you sit down to take the test, number one, set aside about six to eight hours, and number two, clean out your office because they're going to make you scan with your webcam around the room to make sure that there's nobody else in the room with you or you're not doing anything. And my desk tends to be cluttered, so it all ended up in an action packer. But so do that, and then the CPI goes with the individual. So <clears throat> if you just let any tech go out and you, you pay for their CPI certification, they can take that with them and then you're without a cpi as an operator of the business so make sure that you plan that accordingly and once you get your cpi the importance of it is when you put in the information that's what the fcc is going to use to coordinate frequencies so if any of that is wrong from sector headings and things like that you may cause interference with yourself you may cause it with a you know a competitor or a partner and they will come back to the CPI. They're not going to go back to the company. They're going to come back to you. So remember that and why that's so important. And again, to me, that's, I know we complain about the SaaS costs and things like that, but I feel like that price per device is such a small price to pay for, to eliminate the Wild West and to keep from other people stepping on you. And you can guarantee your network is going to work in function. And again, it's also up to you, the operator, and your CPI to get the information put in correctly. So uh, what are the advantages of LTE? Uh, we just touched on it. It's a 3G uh, PP standards-based solution. 
So I, I the, the difference in LTE and just a proprietary 365 solution is LTE will always be driven by global industry standards. So as long as we continue to build to the LTE standards, we will continue to have the LTE uh, compatibility with other networks, with other components. Uh, our CPEs will work on uh, other vendors, enode Bs, and vice versa. You know, our enode Bs will work with other vendor CPEs. That's the beauty of a standards-based product. And that's going to be driven by your global tier one leaders, whether it be a, you know, a Timo, a Verizon, an AT&T, a Vodafone, whatever it is. As long as we stay built within those standards, we are an LTE solution, and we will. I mean, we're we're continuing to grow, and that's why I feel like the 3GPP LTE devices will still be standing when proprietary 365 devices are not, and that's just due to it being driven by standards, not driven by proprietary means. It's just my opinion, but I feel staying standards-based is very important as, as you grow beyond. So the interoperability with other manufacturers, just like I said, if you have an LTE EPC, enode B, and GUI, uh, you can mix and match and interchange. It's all SIM-based authentication, standards-based. You can, you can connect anything to them. So excellent spectrum efficiency. So again, with CBRS, it's gonna help that. But if you have a device like our 436Q, you can run that in carrier aggregation mode, or you can see the antenna ports there. You can also run that in what we call split carrier. And you could take one 436Q unit and you could split sectors up north and south, east and west, and you could run four 65 degree sectors with two 436Q units. And you can utilize the same 20 megahertz going north, the same 20 megahertz going south, and then the same going east and west, you know, or I'm sorry, you know, just a, the same spectrum can be on the east sector as is on the west sector. So that allowed us to create a full 360 degree side with only 40 megahertz. So it, the spectrum efficiency was great. You can break it down now with CBRS to 5, 10, 15, and 20 megahertz. Uh, low power consumption, these devices run on, well, the 436 runs on a MEG48 plant. Uh, the Nova 227 is actually PoE and will run on a on a on a 24 volt. So as far as amps and things like that, very very low power consumption on these devices. Excellent non line of sight performance. It is what it is. It's 365. Obviously, it's not going to penetrate a, a a huge forest. But if you need to compare it to uh, you know a 58 device or some other 365 devices, I would with the right plan, I would put this up against any of them. Uh, you do want to be careful. Obviously, it is LTE, and that ENOB will try to send its best. It will do everything it can to uh, keep a working session up with the weakest link. So, if you were to do a bad install, just like with any device, that ENOB will could possibly use all of its power and resources to try to fix uh, one customer. But as far as the non-line of sight, it, it works fantastic. Reverse compatibility. As we're coming, I mean, my gosh, we've been to CAT4, CAT6, CAT12, and now we're up to CAT15 CPEs. So if you have a CAT15 device, your CAT4 devices are going to connect to it. The only drawback is with a CAT4, uh, some of the features that come out in the releases of CAT4 can do carrier aggregation. That come along in Category 6. So you just want to be uh, uh, cognizant of that. Uh, Built-in quality of service. These guys have excellent security. It is, again, LTE based. So the handshakes and the connections made are secure. Uh, as far as our Cloud Core EPC and things like that, the only piece of information that is really exchanged is the authentication for the SIMs. The rest of the security and things like that stay on, on your network. Uh, it's constantly evolving. Like I said, we, we went through from CAT 12 to CAT 15, the 436Q is out. Uh, later this year, we'll have the 5G products, which is a split architecture with a RRU and a BDU. So it's just not uh, the, the the difference from the CAT6 to the CAT12 to the CAT15 has been almost the, the blink of an eye. 
uh, CBRS certification. This is, goes back to the lightly licensed, but what I'd call pretty well licensed. And you can uh, deploy private LTE networks. So as we get into telehealth, uh, precision agriculture, things like that, the 5.8 spectrum is still going to be pretty mucked up and busy, the 2.4 as well. And for the price point of these devices, you can deploy a private LTE network, say, in a, in a farm or an automation scenario with reliability and probably not a lot more than it would be if you were to try to go with a an unlicensed solution. And with uh, LTE, you are going to get, uh, you know, you're kind of guaranteed of what you're going to get. And this, and the gym right here, this buy sells UPS is something that I really like. We'll see in the next slide as well. But this is our uninterrupted power supply. It has a power over uh, a PoE port, uh, supports VLANs. And that right there, you can power everything on this page and you can deploy in a very small form factor. If you don't have a lot of room, whether it be on a utility pole, uh, whatever, you can just drill it right into the creosote. You can do whatever you want to try there. Let's go to the next one here. So these are some scenarios. Uh, this is our fixed wireless solution here as we get to wrap this down. So as Ronald touched on, our outdoor, our outdoor enobies. So we have our quarter watt unit, which is this 227. Uh, the 227, I really liked. I could deploy this in RV parks. I'm in the heart of the energy sector. So I could go to an RV park. I could deploy a 227. It has a 10 degree built in down tilt, the 65 degree antenna spread. And I could put at the time, uh, now it's up to 96 users, but at the time I could put 32 users in an RV park uh, with indoor CPEs, which I'm not always a big fan of, and uh, get my, uh, my normal ARPU, my normal monthly charge with a, basically a captive audience. The 227s have also been great in subdivisions where you need a micro pop in a hurry. Due to the down tilt, they are very good at not interfering with the rest of your network. And it's it's about 12 inches by 12 inches. So it's it's not heavy, great little device. So our two by one watt is the 233 unit. That's a uh, one sector, uh, one watt. We have the four by one watt, that's our 436Q which does our four by four MIMO, and you can run that in carrier aggregation at uh, the full power, or you can run it as a single carrier, like the 233, or you can run it as a, what I would call a split carrier, like a dual carrier split carrier. So you could run uh, two directions, take two ports to each antenna, and you have one watt, shooting in two different directions you can use the same frequency you can use different frequencies and that was that's what makes that a very valuable and fun unit just with licensing you can go from single carrier to dual carrier to carrier aggregation uh, we have our two by 10 watt which is what ronald was talking about that's one is the one that lives in our middle band and our abs uh, because it is in the two five we can shoot that one at 10 watts uh, again the limitations being whether or not you have that spectrum we also have one uh, 246, which is a two by 20 watt. It's also for the EBS in the middle band and you can have 10 watts shooting in two different directions or you can utilize the, uh, you can run two channels in the same direction if you need it for capacity. So our indoor CPEs, I didn't quite get it changed, but we do have these in CAT four, five, six, seven and uh, Ronald would have to, Tell me if I'm wrong, but I do think that this is the roadmap with 12. They have uh, integrated Wi-Fi and internal and external antennas with SMA connectors. So the I, I like them and I hate them. It's a weird little love-hate relationship because someone will uh, no doubt take these and set them in a window or, or you'll set them close to a window where they have good signal and then somebody will come and they'll put them in a different part of the house and it can really muck up your uh, RF design. But with the SMA connectors, you can put a little external antenna out. I wouldn't recommend these much past a half mile, mile. And again, depending on what, how the house is built. So our outdoor CPEs, we're into the CAT 4, 5, 6, 7, 12, uh, getting ready to do 15. Uh, these are PoE. And when it says PoE with Wi-Fi, the Wi-Fi is actually a management radio. So that's what your guys can use to point these antennas uh, they, they don't provide Wi-Fi out of the antenna as a usable scenario. 
you can use those as a management radio to point the device and ensure you have real good signal. So in the end, we do have a software defined EPC, uh, the cloud, the server, and the ambient uh, enode B is embedded. So that's our cloud core. For the folks that are getting you know, an introductory to LTE, maybe that'd be a, a good next webinar as a, a class on the cloud core. It, it's great for somebody getting in. It does have limitations, uh, but it is, if you're interested in LTE and you wanted to try a toe dip before you got into your own full-blown EPC, the cloud core is the way to go. You have all of the functionality of an EPC. You can gather all of your KPIs. You can see every device, signal level, usage, and things like that. Uh, we have compact outdoor enode bees. Uh, there, I actually got the writing where the four, five, six, seven, 12, 15 uh, indoor units and outdoor units. And we have a cloud-based network management system and billing platform. Uh, our devices are flexible. The power can go from a quarter of a watt all the way up to 40 watts, depending on the spectrum you have. You can uh, one box, one site, lower capex. You know, the capital expenditures to get these uh, off the ground is uh, second to none. Uh, you can do your local uh, traffic breakout and your opex is also very low. Again, I missed the, yeah, no, here's my, the, the UPS. So you can put in the top left corner, you can take a UPS and an enode B, uh, deploy them on just about anything, a billboard, wherever you want it to. What, if anywhere you have a vertical asset that someone will work with you on, that, uh, a GPS that comes with the enode B and a couple antennas and you're up and rolling. And it's, it, it's that easy. So the high performance, there's excellent non-line of sight performance. Now, as we uh, transition into 5G, we can go from 32 to 96 to 256 concurrent users and up to 220 megabits downlink rate. And that's today with carrier aggregation. So the site deployment, uh, we have the compact outdoor UPS, which is there. You have a minimum required footprint. You can power these with solar. A lot of folks are doing now. And we also have an, uh, an IoT, integrated, uh, IoT integrated PLE routers that would also help simplify the installs. So a lot of folks have a scenario where they want to keep a managed router and uh, we have a solution for that too. And the price point is uh, spot on. And I think uh, uh, obviously anybody at Wincom can help with the uh, pricing or we have folks that uh, buy sales, a, a fantastic uh, sales team that can take care of that also. And I think, Ronald, the rest will be up to you and Miss Elaine. I'm not sure if there were any questions, but that was it. That was it for me. So.